Hi, I'm David Cottrell and I'm um, having a great conversation with Matt Letizia today. Thanks for joining me, Matt. Pleasure, mate. Um, yeah, so I want to go straight in. I don't want to, you know, be around the bush too much. Um, I just want to have your thoughts really about um, everything that is going on in the world right now to do with obviously the game that we used to play and we love and, um, and things like that. I just want to know the, the concerns really of how many players are having a lot of issues um, to do with on the pitch, and also the fans that we're having a lot of um, reoccurrence with them. You know, you know, fans collapsing as well in the stands. Yeah, it has been um, very concerning for me watching football over the past twelve months and, and seeing the amount of incidents that have happened, and not just in this country, um, but around the world and in different sports. It's not just football, um, and, and the biggest thing that I've been amazed by is the, the lack of interest from governing body, bodies in terms of wanting to try and find out why there is this increase in uh, sports people who are collapsing on the field of play. Um, you know, I, I had a 17-year career uh, and I never once in 17 years saw uh, a fellow professional uh, collapse on the field of play or in training with heart issues. Uh, and so it's been really concerning to me, um, not only seeing the players suffering, um, but the lack of interest in, in trying to find out uh, why it's happening from the from the relevant authorities. And uh, I think there's a, a real dereliction of duty going on here from from people who purport to care about uh, the players uh, in the game. Yeah, well, I just think um, with my experience as well in terms of um, alcohol and my addiction with that and, and mental health as well, which I've gone over to do with the game as well and the governing bodies or, or people to look after the players with duty of care for that point of view. I kind of feel that we do a lot of tick box exercise and I feel like it's then it's, it's going on again with the you know the pandemic of what, what we've been going through with COVID because the players are actually collapsing and there's not enough study or research that has gone into that. It's kind of like we're pushing it onto people and expecting not them to have a choice and as you say it's, it is very worrying that 
why are these questions not being thrown at people and you know we're not looking into this a lot more so it's kind of like are we looking after them as, as human human beings or are we just you know expecting them just to perform no matter what the there's, there's a lot of different issues obviously to talk about when it comes to, to vaccination and um uh and i believe that uh freedom of choice is is the biggest issue here and, uh and you should be able to free to choose free from coercion i think you should be having all the information available to you before you uh, start taking um, uh, any vaccines. Uh, I think you, if you're if you're just trusting in um, in the government and the pharmaceutical industry, who um, never tell lies, by the way, they never tell lies. <laughs> if you blind if you blindly trust the government and you blindly trust the pharmaceutical industry, then I'm afraid you haven't been paying attention for this time that you've been on the planet. Um, yeah. Just uh, because they don't they don't tell you the truth all the time, you've got to go and search for it yourself, um, and that's the biggest issue for me. Yeah, I think that's the issue, and also, I think I think I seen on um, Twitter not so long ago. I think um, you know you have ex pundits or pundits actually I should say, and also ex players who have played at the highest level. They've had unbelievable careers, and from my point of view, I feel that a lot of the agenda is pushing people to have the vaccination but again without allowing them to have the choice and i think you responded to one the other day and you, then the, the response was well um, we should let the scientists get on with it but if you want the scientists to get on with it why are so many scientists then being um, muted and taken off so social media so there's not just scientists who are actually pushing the agenda there's also scientists who have gone against that but they're being taken off social media so from that point of view if you want the scientists to just crack on with it then why are you as a pundit pushing it for players or, or humans to have it then no that's exactly right i mean there are um, uh, i think one of the things that's concerned me is has been the lack of uh of a counter argument you know, uh, I, I always believe that there's two sides to every story uh, and that you should listen to both sides of the story and then make up your own mind what you feel is right, um, because there are. There's uh, experts saying one thing, um, you know, that it's safe and effective, and there's other experts going, whoa, 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 hang on a minute. There's some red flags coming up here in the, uh, in the yellow card reporting systems that, you know, we need to be aware of. Um, and so, you know, those, those issues are, for me, really concerning when the scientists that go against the government narrative, uh, as you say, are, are being censored, are being taken off of social media. You've got some spotty teenager at Facebook telling them that this world class scientist is uh, not allowed to speak about vaccines, even though he spent his entire life uh, dealing with them. Um, that's a really scary place to be in because uh that's that that's the kind of thing you would expect if you lived in china um and i don't want to live in a country that uh, that behaves in that manner and but we are heading towards that and it's it's not a nice place to be nobody will take uh, any kind of responsibility and they and they haven't finished yet you know sajid javid um came out last week and said oh there'll be no no mandates, uh, mandatory vaccinations for the uh, NHS workers. And, and then he goes behind their backs and goes to the uh, regulators trying to get them to enforce uh, that. You know, it's it's all just smoke and mirrors with them. Lot. And um, uh, if, if you think this is uh, close to being done, um, then uh, I'm afraid you're, you're sadly mistaken. They will keep pushing and keep trying. You know, there's stuff going through Parliament at the moment that they're the online safety uh, harms bill, um, it, it, which is going to strip away more human rights if we let them do that. Um, so they'll keep pushing and they'll keep going uh, and they'll keep trying to take away your, your liberties um, and I'll be fighting back against them. Uh, we're going to be in a very bad place. Um, people would go to the gym to mentally let loose of how they're feeling, to keep in a routine, etc., etc. But they weren't open opening, and I just thought, well, what trying to, you know, what kind of agenda are you pushing here? Because people need to stay healthy to do with mental health and so on. But they're just the rules were changing so much; it just didn't make sense to me. What do you feel about that? I think what's been what's been amazing is the is the cognitive distance of, of some people to to actually not believe what they're seeing with their own eyes. Um, and when you try to talk to people about it, 
uh, you know, if you mention kind of Klaus Schwab and the, and the Great Reset, and they go, oh, that's a conspiracy theory. Now, I'm not being funny. It doesn't take much research to know he's actually written a book called The Great Reset uh, yeah. with all their plans laid out in the book. And if you go on the World Economic Forum website, all of their plans are laid out for everyone to go and look. And they have to do that. That's what they do. They, they, everything is in plain sight. And you just have to go and look for it. Um, but most people still believe um, whatever they hear on the television uh, and the, the people who are in, uh, in charge of the mainstream media um, uh, are also the ones that are uh, um, in charge of what they're doing to the, the population. So you'll never get a balanced argument on there. Um, uh, and I'm afraid it's been it's been the, the biggest psychological operation ever done to mankind. Um, uh, and uh, I think more and more people are starting to cotton on to, to what's going on. Um, but it's, it, it all depends on the on the amount of people and whether you can get that critical mass to to actually um just say no that no i'm not having this I'm not doing this uh, this isn't good enough um and you know we have to we have to stick together and and try to force our way out of it because you do not comply your way out of tyranny you're talking about legends of the games who are trying to push this agenda i just feel that you're blatantly lying because you've played some of the guys that are, are pushing this they've played for 15 20 years at the highest level and if you're saying you've never played with someone or seen anyone collapse on a pitch and they're then promoting it on TV, they have a very big following, I just think, fuck me. Or do you think that these people are actually being told to push this agenda? I think it's a combination of things. Um, I think some people are genuinely, have genuinely been scared um, by the propaganda. Um, you, know, you know, really, really scared and believe that, you know, this is the bubonic plague and like, 50% of people that get COVID will end up dying. Uh, there probably are still because of the propaganda that's gone on the last two years are actually people who, who do believe that. Um, uh, I, I then think you'll get a percentage of people who know that something's wrong, but they'll shut up because um, uh, they value their job and they don't want to lose their job. Um, and uh, um, I'm well aware of that situation. Um, <laughs> And then you'll get people uh, who I think are compromised individuals uh, who are easily to, easy to manipulate um, because the powers that be um, have things over them and they can get them to say and back whatever they want to do um, because they, are, they have uh, information on them that compromises them. The, the point that you're making there where you know people are getting the choice to, to basically have it or you're going to get sacked. It's like the recent thing that's gone on with the NHS stuff. It's kind of like being around you know vulnerable people and okay to a certain point to look after you. But because we've put a rule in place and a date in place, if you don't follow what we say, then you lose your job. Like the censor, censorship that we're experiencing on social media, even when I'm posting, I'm no big fish by any stretch of the imagination, but when I'm posting on social media, it's like I would get... If I post my dog, for example, seven or eight thousand people might view my story on Instagram. Then if I talk about COVID, it'd literally be hundreds. The world we're actually going into right now is there's no free speech whatsoever that's going to be going down that route. And so it's not just purely about what's happening with COVID. The, the, the goals that are getting put in place, people are not following. And before you know, we're going to be in a very dangerous you know, society and country that we're living in. Absolutely. It's been, it's been creeping up on us for, for many, many years with the whole uh, political correctness stuff, um, you know, and, and certain words you're not allowed to say. And, um, you know, they've hijacked people's speech um, and are basically telling people what they're allowed to say. Um, now, uh, I, I don't know, about, <laughs> I don't know about, it, about how you feel about it, but for me, once you've lost your freedom of speech, uh, you, you're in a really, really dangerous place. The bill that they're trying to get through Parliament to stop people protesting um, it is just unbelievable that they would try and do that. Um, you know, it's, it's the one thing that we've got uh, that we, we can use to try and hold these people in power. Um, uh, and it's... It is a really scary place if 
the government and uh, the big tech companies are monitoring your your speech and can imprison you for just using the wrong word. Um, now uh, I'm of a, uh, probably of a, of a generation that that just thinks that you know we're all we're all grown adults and I, I grew up in a world of where sticks and stones may break my bones but names will never hurt me quite frankly if a football club is only going to sign vaccinated players uh, then I think the person that is making that decision at the football club isn't worthy of being in the position of, of um, power that he's got because he's obviously not thinking straight um, <laughs> quite frankly obviously not looking at uh, any of the evidence uh, and um Actually, it's quite a stupid thing to do. I I find it quite bizarre that um, it, it's it's not allowed to be spoken about. Um, mm. You know, you have the whole issue with with Sergio Aguero, one of the best strikers in the whole world, who has to retire early for heart issues, um, and yet the one question never asked in the press conference or by anybody is Sergio, were you vaccinated? Do you, did you know? Do, do you not think this might have something to do with it? Uh, and yet nobody was willing to ask that question. Nobody's willing to investigate whether or not that had something to do with it. Uh, and when you're when you're not willing to look at the evidence in front of your eyes and do something about it, then that just makes me more suspicious uh, of the authorities that they're not even willing to even take a look at the situation and do an investigation to find out what it is. And they, the only explanation is because they, they know what it is and they don't want everyone else to know what it is. Yeah. Uh, that's the logical conclusion that I can come to because otherwise, um, you know, it's just not a, a natural human reaction. There's a reason why there was a whole bunch of behavioural psychologists on the SAGE committee right at the start and there was no epidemiologists on there. Um, you know, uh, that, that, that has all been done by design. And, and quite frankly, um, uh, those people need um, investigating because of what they have done to the people of this country in terms of the psychological manipulation uh, and the, the dividing of the, uh, of the population. Uh, I think it's disgusting what they've done, quite frankly. And, but I, I, think, I think we're probably from the same... Um, thinking is that it should probably just get brushed under the carpet. When these big people are making mistake after mistake, it's kind of like, oh, okay, well, we can behave how we want, but then, you know, you can't. It's kind of, I remember when uh, Jack Grealish, I think he popped out to see a friend in the, in the first pandemic, he got absolutely slaughtered all over the, the media. Yeah, I don't see that from number 10 when they did it, it's like, oh, they've had a party. Yeah, they, they had a little bit of a hammering, but nowhere near is like, oh, well, he's a spoiled little rich kid and he's like, he's this, he's that, it's the usual stuff. I just feel like as soon as a sports star does something, they absolutely crucify him. It's distraction tactics just to stop you from actually realising what's what's really going on at the top. Um, because let's be honest, the people that, that control the media are the same people that control our government. Um, yeah. and and governments around the world. Klaus Schwab has um, boasted about it, you know, infiltrating the, uh, the, the parliaments around the world um, through his young global leadership campaign with, uh, just drives me, it drives me mad that people don't even want to talk about it in the media because they're all complicit. Um, and, you know, you've got to go and search elsewhere for your information um, if, you, if you want to get the actual truth. Obviously, you're a pundit now, you had an amazing football career. Um obviously watched you scoring some absolute fucking worldies <laughs> and uh, of course you're on one of the biggest um, watch TV you know shows probably really Soccer Saturday and and obviously a major company like Sky do you feel that you're being pressurised to um, stop talking about your views to act a certain way and if so I'm, I'm taking from the points you've said today that you, you know you like to have your own choice and, and that's who you are yeah, I mean, there was. I had a couple of warnings um, from Sky before they actually sacked me, um, warning me about what I was tweeting about. Um, but, but quite frankly, um, I, I go with my heart, and um, something was telling me that something's not right, and I can't shut up about it. Um, you know, uh, and I feel like um, 
if you know that something is is so badly wrong uh, and you actually sit there and say nothing about it then you actually become complicit in that crime um, yeah. i wasn't prepared to do that uh, in knowing that it was probably going to cost me my job anyway so I'm assuming as well, if, you, if that was if that was pushed on you as a football player, you said right, have the have the vax or 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 don't play, you you still you choose not playing. Oh, absolutely. Because that's it. Because um, I had this discussion the other day with a few um, football players and a few people as well, and I'm quite similar to you. It's like literally, as soon as I wake up, I feel so passionate about it that even if I'm just passing the message on to one person and as I said before you know you have a much bigger following and a bigger platform than I do but if I just sat there and just kept quiet I'd be exactly like everyone else just following suit and just being you know that sheep behavior and, and nothing the reason why we got to the point where we are now is because so many people before us have, sh have shut their mouths and not really stepped up when, when you know shit hit the fan and you know, a few a few people have said to me who are in the public domain have said, "Well, I can't follow you on social media because I don't really give a damn about." I was posting about the um, the Maxwell case and Epstein case as well, along with this with the pandemic. And I just thought to myself, if you don't give a shit about the rules that are getting put in place for you, and ultimately you have children that is going to be left behind for when you leave and and leave your children behind, you're not doing your job properly because you should look after your children's future and you're not and the fact that you're not looking after your children's future to do with the pandemic and then you actually think that people talking and bringing light about the sex trafficking to do with children all over the world then what the f what the fuck are we talking about these days i know i know it's incredible people just want to uh I, I, they almost want to turn a blind eye to it because it because it's too uncomfortable for them yeah um, uh, and you know it's it, there's, there's a, a, a quite a, a big majority of people that that would prefer to uh, actually live with the uh, comfortable lies as opposed to facing up to the uncomfortable truth. You know, I did obviously want to touch on your um, career as well. You had an amazing career. Stayed with Southampton. Um, scored absolute worldies, by the way. Did you ever have a chance to leave Southampton, or were you just were you just happy being there? Uh, yeah, the closest I came to leaving was uh, when I was twenty one, and Spurs tried to buy me, uh, and I was a I was a Spurs fan as a kid, um, so that was that was quite tempting, and they were the only club I actually uh, spoke to. So I went with my agent, and we had a, a meeting with Spurs representatives up in London, um, and I actually agreed terms on a contract and I actually signed uh, the contract um, uh, obviously that, <laughs> that was a bit illegal at that point so I was still on the contract <laughs> um, the the idea was that that contract would then be just locked away and would yeah. only be bought up when the two clubs would agree the fee at the end of the season um, but before that that happened I changed my mind um, and uh, and so the contract that I'd signed obviously just should have become null and void and burnt and nobody should ever have known about it. Um, however, uh, the top of the chairman at the time, um, Irving Scholar, decided about seven years after that that he was going to do an autobiography. Um, and he, he put that in his autobiography and basically stitched me up <laughs> in his autobiography. So I was like, oh, cheers for that. I, I remember playing a game at, we played a, a League Cup game at Peterborough and I remember coming out of the change room at the end, going to get on the bus, and there was a reporter um, just as I was about to get on the bus, and he and he stopped me and he went, um, Matt, but, um, have you read Irving Scholar's book? And I was like, uh, no, why? <laughs> he went, oh, he's saying that you uh, you signed a contract to join Tottenham. Um, and I was like, oh, did he? Oh, well, never mind. <laughs> and I just walked off. <laughs> and... Uh, it kind of all blew over, um, and uh, I didn't get into any trouble for that. I think that do you know, do you know? What I remember when um, I was at Bristol City as a, as a kid, and I think I just turned seventeen. I was gonna um, Norwich put a bid in for me, so the director of football there came down to Cardiff because I was away with Wales on international duty, and my agent was there at the time. So I signed for Norwich in the morning, and then I jumped on the coach then to go to training for uh, for Wales, 
And on the way to training, the Bristol City chairman said, oh look, we've just accepted um, a bid from a Premier League team, which is Wigan. And um, anyway, so I spoke to my agent, I said, look, the Premier League club's just come in, I've just signed for Norwich. He said, oh, don't worry, we've just um, put that on the back burner. So we, that was put aside as well. So I eventually then went and signed for Wigan. So <laughs> not as, um, it's quite similar to your story. But yeah, it, I think back then you get away with a little bit more and, and that's just the way it was. What, um, who is, who is the, um, who's the best manager that you've played for in terms of you know, philosophy and not just purely about total football or your style of play that you would like, but in terms of man management, of looking after the players, of kind of like a well-being side of things as well, because I'm sure back then it was not really looked into that much, but who did you think that was, do you know what, this guy's ahead of the game? Um, well, my, my favourite manager I played for in terms of his man management of me was Alan Ball. Um, you know, he had a way about him, a passion about him when he spoke about football. Um, and obviously, he, he won the World Cup, you know, and, uh, and so as soon as he walked in, in through the doors, you're like, Jesus, this, this bloke's won the World Cup. we we got to listen to him. He knows what he's on about. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and then he, he obviously had a, a very high opinion of me and he built the team around me. Um, and he made me feel 10 feet tall from the very first training session. You know, and uh, it was just a, a, a brilliant 18 months of my career when he was my manager. And that was the time when I was scoring most of those worldies. Um, <laughs> uh, and I got, he was in charge for 18 months and he, he, he was, uh, we played 60, I think he was in charge for 66 games. And I missed one through injury and one through suspension. Uh, so I played 64 times and I scored 45 goals in those 64 games. Wow. And uh, I wasn't even playing as a centre forward. That was just like an, an attacking midfielder's role. Um, so that was just a, an unbelievable period in my career. So he, he'll always be my favourite manager. He probably wasn't the, the best tactically, uh, but in terms of his man management of me and how he got the best out of me, it was just uh, amazing. I would say tactically, Glenn Hoddle was probably the, uh, the best manager that, that I ever played under in terms of being able to set his team up to exploit any weaknesses in the opposition. Um, and he was very good at that. Shame he had no man management skills whatsoever. I know it's very hard to have the, the blend of both, isn't it? Well, obviously the, the ones who do the, the, the top, like, you know, Guardiola, et cetera. And who is, who would you, who is the um, funniest teammate you've had? Funniest teammate? Um, I, I think there was a, there was a, a brilliant combination uh, of two lads, um, in Ian Dowie and Tim Flowers. Um, when, when those two were together, uh, they were brilliant. Um, they were probably the, the, the quickest, quick witted, most quick witted lads. Um, you know, would just find the smallest detail about some gear that you were wearing and they would absolutely crucify you for it. <laughs> they, they, they double team you. Do you know what I mean? You were just like swamping. <laughs> they didn't have nowhere to go. <laughs> Absolutely hammering you. So, uh, so they were they were they were probably the, the funniest two in uh, in my in my time. And I want to ask you a few quick fire. I want, I want you to choose um, players who you'd go for. Um, the strikers now. I want to choose. Who would you choose to have in your team? The Brazilian Ronaldo or Thierry Henry? Oh. <laughs> Um, that's a choice. <laughs> I'd probably go with the Brazilian Ronaldo, but but it's close. Oh, it's very close. very close. It could go either way. Um, Cafu or Dani Alves? Oh, me. Um, I think I'd go Dani Alves. Yeah, he's. To be fair, they're both unreal, aren't they? <laughs> He's still going. Uh, I mean, he got red carded last week, but <laughs> I saw that. Um, but now he's been a, a, a unbelievable player over so many years at, at a top top club, um, and he's just been phenomenal. But Cafu wasn't bad either. Let's be no, fair. Exactly, yeah. Um, and who would you go for, Messi or Maradona? Um, I would. Blind me. Um. I would probably go with Messi um, because he didn't score a dodgy handball goal against us. <laughs> <laughs> Is that the only reason? <laughs> and he's probably, um, 
a bit more of a role model to the young lads, shall we say? I just think, I just think, um, I can't have an opinion about obviously Maradona because I didn't, I didn't see him play as much. But I think Messi is certainly the best player I've ever seen. I mean, it's very difficult um, uh, because uh, the different eras that they played in. Yeah. I mean, I have to, I have to say, Maradona. Um, the treatment that he got from defenders and still was able to do what he did was absolutely phenomenal. I mean, Messi gets it a little bit, but back in the 80s... Oh, yeah, Jesus they were taking Christ. it out by you. Tell you oh, what my favourite is when you see... <laughs> it's amazing. Honestly, when you see, it, when you see it, some it, of the it, older it, pundits, and they're like, oh, that's a bad tackle, and then you see, you know, like, they're t- <laughs> in their tackles, they're taking them up by their necks and their shoulders. <laughs> it's, it's incredible. You literally had to do GBH on somebody to get a yellow card. <laughs> yeah. It was incredible. It really was. You know, I mean, the defenders were always allowed at least one free hit before the referee would get a card out. <laughs> it, it was honestly, it was bizarre. You had to, uh, you had to have uh, a lot of mental toughness about you to be able I to. Bet you to did, be able yeah. to... Some of the tackles are crazy. And who, who do you? Um, I want, I want you to ask. Uh, I want to ask you, um, who do you think is the best player of all time? And I also want to know. Who you think is the best British player of all time? I tell you what, I'm throwing you on the spot here. <laughs> um, I mean, the the best player of all time, I, I, I would say probably in my lifetime, I would probably say Lionel Messi. Um, yeah. uh, I, I really do. I, I just it's just phenomenal what he's able to do. Um, I mean, the fact that everybody knows that he's so left-footed and yet he, can just, he still still manages to work the ball onto his left foot and curl it in the top <laughs> corner at the end of the box. I mean, don't these people learn? I mean, <laughs> uh, yeah, so I, I mean, I didn't see a huge amount of Pele. Um, you know, it was probably just a little bit before my time. Um, Maradona would have been up there. Johan Cruyff would have been up there. Zinedine Zidane, you know, Ronaldo, the two Ronaldos. Uh, but for me, I think Messi just edges it. Um, I think he's been phenomenal over uh, such a long period of time. Um, greatest British player of all time? That's a good question. <laughs> uh, I, I think if you're, if you're talking British and not just English, then I think I'd have to say George Best. Um, you know, I, again, I only kind of caught the back end of, of Bestie's career, really. Um, but saw enough of him uh, on the television, uh, enough clips of him to to see, you know. And again, he was having to deal with. He was probably worse. His era was probably worse than Maradona's for yeah, having exactly. to deal with yeah. and just absolutely chopping you at every possible opportunity. <laughs> um, so, in terms of a, a British player, you know, I, I think you you'd say George Best. You know, you, you've had kind of gigs in Gaza and. Um, Kenny Dalgleish, that those kind of players, but I think Bestie for me would, would take it. Do you know what I remember? My middle name is George Best, and when I um, I went to get a notice biography signed by George Best, and when I went there, and I had my birth certificate, and he was going to sign it, and he turned around to his wife Alex because oh look at his middle name, and she said she just turned around. I was only young, she goes oh fuck's sake, not another one. <laughs> I thought oh he's a bit of trouble even from like a young age, but yeah, it, it's quite embarrassing because when I got when I got married, they obviously, you know, say your full name in the red, in the in the church, etc. And it's just like fucking everyone's, you know, it's supposed to be a nice day, and everyone's just laughing at my middle name. And <laughs> um, and who is that? Who's the best player you've played with? Uh, best player I played with, well, uh, you know, at uh, England it was briefly, but uh, you know, Gaza, I think for me was probably the best Englishman of my generation, and uh, so I got to play a little bit. Um, with him, so that was pretty special. Was he not? Was he not one of the um, one of the funniest guys you've played with? Was he one of the funniest guys? Yeah. Well, I didn't spend a lot of time with him off the pitch, um, so you know, it, I didn't really get to probably see his full repertoire of uh, stupid things. I've heard a lot about him from from mates of mine who played alongside him at Spurs and all that kind of stuff. Um, and he does sound like an absolute lunatic. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so yeah, I mean, he he would have been up there for most people who have played in a club team alongside him. I'm sure most people would answer uh, that question with uh, with him as the answer. 
No, I love it. Um, and if you were, if you, what's the best advice that you've been given um, that you that has always stuck with you throughout life, whether it's to do with you know playing football or to do with you know business, whatever it might be? What is the one thing that sticks in your mind to, that helps you on a day to day basis? When I was at school, somebody somebody came out. I couldn't tell you who the guy was. Uh, I don't remember his name. Um, but he came in and gave a talk to all the, the entire school. And I remember sitting there and, and he said, uh, he said he, he believed that everybody in this life is born with a gift. They're born to do something very well. He said, the best thing you can do, he said, is find out what that is and do it to the best of your ability. Um, and uh, I remember coming away from that and thinking, do you know what, I, I'm good at football. I, that, I, that's what I want to do. That's what I, I want that to be my life. Um, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do the best I can with it. Um, and that's what I try to do. And is that, is, if, if you're speaking to an aspiring young footballer as well, or aspiring young person, is that what you'd, would you say that advice to them? Is that the advice you'd pass on to them as well? It's, if it's specifically, because it wasn't specifically about sport, the, the chat, but if it was specifically about football, um, then I, I would give two pieces of advice um, to, to aspiring footballers. One would be to, uh, to listen to people who have been where you want to get to. So people who have, have experienced, you know, playing in the top flight, playing international football, um, they generally know what they're on about. So I, I, when they speak, listen. Um, and uh, a bit of advice I, I always gave to any aspiring strikers or a, a, any goal-scoring midfielders. Um, and it was something that I learned very on in my career. Uh, and that was as a striker. You've always got a split second longer than you think you've got when you're in the penalty area. So don't panic. Don't snatch. You've heard, because it, 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 the amount of times you just people you just see people and the ball's there and they just want to go oh get, get shot in quick before the defender comes but sometimes actually you know you've you always got a little bit longer than you think so just don't panic see that's great advice I love it and I've um, coming away again from football I've noticed you've actually been on a protest how did that go. Yeah, I went to uh, the um, protest in, in London uh, a few weeks back. Um, my wife and my daughter came with me as well. Um, and it was, a, it was a really positive experience, to be honest. It was the first time I, I'd ever been in a protest in my life. Um, it's, the, it's the only time I've ever felt strongly enough about something to, uh, or, or known enough about something to, to actually go and stand up and, and uh, go along with like-minded people. Um, uh, and protest against the, the measures that this government are taking. Um, and yeah, it was, a, it was a cracking day, really enjoyed it. On, um, on social media, when you are actually talking about these, um, obviously this subject and you're going to protest, do you find that you have a lot of support? It's, it's really odd. Um, obviously, I, I was speaking out quite early on, um, probably before we went into the first lockdown, actually. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and back then, I would have said 90% of the replies were, were very negative and very, um, very much abusive towards me. Um, and I've noticed in the last three or four months, um, it has literally flipped the other way to now 90% of people are really supportive of what I've been saying. Um, and do you know what? I've been consistent throughout it all. Uh, I've stood my ground. Uh, I, I took the slings and arrows early on um, uh, and I still stood my ground because I believed what I was saying was right. Uh, and the last few months have really made me um, actually think, do you know what? You were right to do that because the, the difference now is just incredible in the, in the amount of support that I now get on social media. In turn, it, it, I would say it's gone now 90% supportive uh, and 10% against it really has flipped that much in the last few months no I love it I, I think that's I think that's the issue because you've you've followed through with it and you've kept with it it's you know you've, you've believed in what you're 
you're talking about. I think when you have that passion, it's kind of sometimes I'm I'm similar. I, I wake up some days, I'm thinking, right, so I just have a day off it and just chill out. But I'm just thinking, I can't. I just can't get. <laughs> I can't get away from it because I I believe so strongly in it. Um, and what I'm saying, I've done enough research that what I'm talking about, I can back it up a little bit. Um, and that's the important thing. If you've got an, if you've got an opinion, um, that's fine. But you you also need stuff to back up that opinion. And if you've got that, then you can be confident in what you're saying uh, and be willing to sit and debate people if they want to if they want to challenge you on what you're saying. Um, and, and that's that's I've kind of I've kind of tried to. You know, I, I've tried and keep what I've said fairly factual. Um, and the, you know, for one of the one of the funniest things I've found is when you actually just you you say a sentence uh, which is factually uh, you you cannot argue against it. it it's absolutely hundred. And then and then you get somebody to reply who will have read something into your statement that you know that they that they believe and then they start attacking you for something that you haven't even said do you know what i i always think that as well when i when i post something that's real factual and i've got the resource and awareness because if you've got a source for that um can you give me the source i just think look i'm not a news feed why don't you why don't you do a little bit of research yourself i can't just hand you everything this i'm just posting my view on things and because Say for example, when the BBC or Sky are posting some, you know, posting something, no one ever questions what they're statistically putting out. But when you have your view on something, like, well, where, what source did you get that from? This is not true, blah blah blah. Because I think it was, you know, I think with the footballers that would um, drop in um, to do with cardiac arrests or having heart problems in December alone, um, they had the same amount of numbers of the the average to do with the previous years just for that one month and that's actually a fact and people are still saying no I don't believe it <laughs> and it's just like well, it's like it is it, it's been a form of it's been a form of brainwashing you know there, there's no two ways about it a lot of the population were brainwashed I think slowly they are waking up um, but there was definitely uh, a, a big percentage that were completely and utterly brainwashed and you know, one of the one of the primary ways you get to brainwash somebody um, is by repetition. Yeah, uh, and and that's all they've done on the news cycles for two years now. The repetition of the COVID news and the COVID deaths and the COVID cases, and now it's on the radio every advert. Get your jab, get your booster. It's just repetition, 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 and uh, a lot of people are susceptible to that. Fortunately, uh, I saw through the bullshit a long time ago. But this is my point: is when people say to me, you know, I was in um, Costco a few weeks back, I think it was. It was actually before Christmas, and this woman, I was not wearing a mask because I don't wear them, um, and I had this woman come out of her way. And she left. Her husband was queuing for some food, and she's come over to me. She's like, "You're a disgrace. You are out of nowhere, by the way." And I'm minding my own business. She goes, "You're a disgrace." I was like, "What? Excuse me?" And she's like, "Well, you're not wearing a mask. You shouldn't even be allowed in here." Blah blah blah. And I just said, "Look, I didn't get come out of my way to tell you how ridiculous you look with your mask on. You shouldn't come into my private space and do the same thing." And she goes, I'm going to make him a uh, complaint, blah, blah, blah. I said, well, we're going to tell Mr. Fucking Costco to throw me out because I'm obviously breaking the rules. I said, but I walk past members of staff and they haven't said a word to me. I said, but um, if you feel so strongly about it, your child that you have there, he's, what, 14, 15? He's a teenager. I said, he hasn't got a mask on. So if you felt that strongly about it, you should put one on him because, of course, they're at that age that so you can have it. And I think the husband felt quite embarrassed because... You know, he kept his guard, he kept away, and then half of that, they just kept their head down. But I just thought, as you say, they've been brainwashed that much that it's just got in their head that they feel really scared by it. And and I said to her, I said, look, have you have you had your vaccination? She said, yes, and I've had the booster. I said, well, you should you should not be in no danger then. Yeah, what are you worried about? Like, if you've had all that, you shouldn't then be so scared to be around others. And you can pass it on just as much as I can pass it on. No, absolutely, man. No, but... You know, I think there is a, a percentage of people that are now 
people starting to question it, but I think there'll always be a percentage of, of people who would have been so frightened that they won't be able to ever see it. You're right. Yeah, that's crazy. So, so have you have you left Sky? You've left Sky. I thought what? You've left Sky. Yeah, yeah, I left Sky uh, September 2020. So was that the choice of was that purely because of your views on actually what's been going on in the world or? Um. They didn't. They didn't say exactly that. Yeah, of course they didn't. They covered their ground. <laughs> they did that, um, but also uh, um, with the the new diversity um, that's going on uh, in, in that company as well. Uh, I don't think uh, a show with five middle aged white members is ever going to uh, survive that long. Yeah, I, I think there was there was definitely um, something in that. Um, Thank you.